Picture your perfect burger. What image came to mind? For many, it will be the typical beef burger. But I don't think there'd be too much opposition if I proposed a new definition for the perfect burger. One that is tasty, but is not unhealthy, not expensive, and has a low impact on the environment. More on that later. First, let's look back in time. Once, and this was not very long ago, people ate beef and other meat only occasionally. But then it became normal to eat meat every day. And some people began to have meat in nearly every meal. Businesses that just wanted to sell more started to offer steak night and burger challenges. Far more meat than anyone needed or even wanted. But somehow it became trendy, so people bought into it. There's a restaurant called the Heart Attack Grill. This is not fiction. You can buy uh, 10,000 calorie burger. That's four days worth of food. In fact, they now offer right up to an octuple burger, and you can optionally add 40 slices of bacon on top. If you weigh in at over 25 stone, that's 160 kilograms, you eat for free. Can you believe that? As you might expect, this is in the USA, the American dream, eh? But this one is local, and you've probably seen one similar. Mass-producing beef comes with all sorts of unintended consequences. The animals themselves are often not treated at all well. The excess of red meat leads to disease and obesity in the people. And the whole planet suffers. For cows, like lambs, being ruminant animals, produce methane, a greenhouse gas around 34 times more potent than CO2. Cows need huge amounts more land and water than other animals and are the leading cause of deforestation, reducing how much CO2 can be absorbed instead of going into the atmosphere. I may be the first person at TED or TEDx to reference an XKCD comic. Uh, I've checked the source and it seems sound. Can you see, um, it's a great visualisation, but it does show a disturbing reality. In the middle is the weight of all those humans. And that much bigger section on the left are all the cattle we keep for our consumption. Look how few wild mammals there are, by comparison, dotted around the edges. In just a few decades, humans have driven a huge drop in biodiversity as we monopolise the earth for ourselves. And as we become more aware of the impact of our addiction to beef, are we reducing how much of it we eat? No. According to the World Resources Institute, global demand for beef is projected to increase by 95% by 2050. You may be realising why I call this talk the burger apocalypse. Human impact on the earth is not sustainable. We're making improvements in some areas. The Paris Agreement has just come into force. That's a huge step forward. But currently, things are still getting worse. Uh, Mass-producing beef is one example of that. But beef is just one part of our food system. I prefer to look at all foods and focus on the solutions rather than the problems. Governments and businesses have a part to play. But what I really want to tell you today is there is a range of easy ways you can cut your food carbon footprint. I call this my ABC of low carbon eating. A, avoid wasting food. One third of all food produced is wasted. In the UK, as is the norm for developed countries, much more is wasted in homes than in food manufacture or retail. For every five bags of shopping we bring home, we put one of them straight in the wheelie bin on the way to the front door. Well, not directly, but a bit wasted here, a bit there. That's what it amounts to. And most of this is deemed avoidable or food that could have been eaten. I'll give you an example. Potatoes. In the UK, we throw out 10 million potatoes a day in households. They're fully avoidable. We throw out the equivalent way to gain in potato skins. They are classed as possibly avoidable, because some people eat them. Households in the UK spend £500 a year on the food that they throw away. And the thing is, it's quite easy to avoid a lot of it. You just have to think about it in advance. If you were asked, 
What tip would you give people to avoid wasting food? I've been asking people this question, and their responses sum it up well. Most important is plan your meals before going to the supermarket so that you only buy what you need and will use. If you do have extra, use it in another meal or freeze it. I've learned that I don't get through a whole loaf while it's fresh, so now I put four or six slices in the freezer when I first open it. Then there's expiry dates. People have opposing views on this one. Some say, pay attention to them, which makes sense. It means rotate the contents of your cupboard or fridge so the items going off sooner are at the front and not forgotten about. Others say, ignore expiry dates. Don't throw something like bread or fruit out just because of the date. Instead, use your senses. If something like bread or fruit looks OK and smells OK, it probably is. So that's A, avoid wasting food. B, buy in season food. The carbon footprint of some fruits and vegetables can be more than 10 times higher when they're not in season. Let's take a look at that typical burger again. Right now, in November, some of the common toppings, the lettuce, the tomatoes, they're not in season in the UK. Did you ever consider that a burger eaten now, or through the winter and spring, has a higher carbon footprint than the same burger in the summer? People get preoccupied with whether, whether food is local, but whether it's in season is more important for its carbon footprint. In his book, How Bad Are Bananas?, Mike Berners-Lee tells us that bananas in the UK are low carbon, as they come from Central or South America by boat. Conversely, you might get UK-grown strawberries in the winter, but they'll be grown in a hothouse using fossil fuel energy, so it could be 12 times higher carbon than between May to September when they're in season. So did you get that? Uh, fruit grown in season over 5,000 miles away can be much lower carbon than fruit grown nearby out of season. Asparagus is one of your five a day all year round, but buy it outside the UK's short growing season of April to June, and it's around 30 times higher as it will be air freighted in from Peru. With global trade and supermarkets selling most foods year round, it can be hard to know which foods are in season. So to solve this, I've created a seasonality chart so you can check before going to the shops. So that's A. Um, sorry, A is avoid wasting food. B, buy in season food. But the action that can have the biggest effect is C, choose low carbon food more. Food accounts for between 20 and 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. Choosing low carbon food more sounds straightforward, but like with seasonality, it can be hard to know which foods are high and which are low carbon. So let's take a closer look. I'm gonna show you two foods at a time, and I want you to guess which one has the lower carbon footprint. Here's the first pair. Is beef or pork lower carbon? They're all per kilogram of that food. So I can hear most of you are thinking pork, and that's right. In fact, beef and lamb are around three times higher carbon than pork or chicken, mainly due to the methane produced. So even people who don't want to reduce how much meat they eat can switch from beef or lamb to pork and chicken and cut two thirds of the associated carbon footprint off. Bread or rice? Think about the underlying reasons. So, as I've heard again, a lot of people say rice because they think bread is processed, but bread is lower. Rice is about three times as high. Rice is high carbon for several reasons. Over 90% of rice is grown in flooded paddy fields, and the absence of oxygen in the soil generates methane. It takes energy to pump that water into the fields, and a lot of fertilizer is used, which releases nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas much more potent than methane. Transporting it, usually from Southeast Asia, only adds a little more by comparison. The next one, tomatoes or oranges. Oranges are lower. Despite being imported, mostly from Spain for the UK market, with their thick skin, like the bananas I mentioned earlier, 
They'll be transported by land or sea, so they're low carbon. With tomatoes, there's a big variation. If you grow your own in late summer, that's very low carbon. For purchased tomatoes, most of the year in the UK, they'll be artificially heated, so that leads to a high carbon footprint. Bringing them in from Spain is a little better. In the winter, you can stick to tin tomatoes. And generally, the large salad, classic salad tomatoes are better because other specialist varieties are lower yield. Cod or chicken? It's cod. Fish in general is a low carbon source of protein. Our demand for chicken is now so high, tens of billions of chickens a year, that we need to grow fields of grain and soya bean just to feed the chickens. Cod are caught at sea, so they feed themselves. And it doesn't take a huge amount of diesel to get a boatload of fish. Overfishing is an important issue, but that's separate to the carbon footprint. You can use the Good Fish Guide to check your fish is from a sustainable source. And last one, cheese or chicken? Yeah, unfortunately for cheese lovers, which is most of us, cheese is a lot higher carbon than chicken, at least twice as high. Cheese is dairy, so it needs those methane belching cows. But if you have a smaller portion of cheese than you would chicken, it's not so bad because it's gram for gram. And soft cheese is lower impact than hard cheese, as it needs a lot less milk. People sometimes ask me how different diets compare. For those who eat a high amount of meat, their food carbon footprint is two and a half times higher than vegans. But I'm not saying you need to go vegan. People can take one step down on this chart, and it makes a big difference. Except cutting out fish, because they're low carbon. And as I said, switching from high to lower impact meats cuts off around 12% the food carbon footprint. Going back to the burger apocalypse, there may be another solution. Remember I proposed a new definition for the perfect burger? Have you heard of the impossible burger? It launched in the US recently after five years of research. It's a plant-based burger. Their magic ingredient is heme, which is what makes meat meaty. But you can get it from plants as well as animals. It has one-eighth the greenhouse gas emissions than beef, but it smells, sizzles, and apparently tastes like beef. Meat eaters and burger lovers are trying it and giving it positive reviews. It may just be something that persuades people to switch. How something tastes is a bigger factor for the average person than the ethical or environmental argument. Hopefully it will spread, but for now, please, don't fly over to New York just to try a low-carbon burger. <laughs> Another incentive is cost. Making modest improvements across my ABC would save the average household one to 200 pounds a year. More substantial improvements would save around 500 pounds. And for eliminating avoidable food waste, buying only in-season food, and switching to low-carbon food, the saving approach is £1,000 a year. One more great way to cut your food carbon footprint and again save money. Eat less, especially protein. The World Resources Institute says we need around 50 grams of protein a day, yet it's now common in the West to consume much more than this. And the excess protein is often the expensive, unhealthy, high carbon kind. And it's similar right across my ABC. There are three great reasons to switch to low carbon food. It reduces your impact on the planet. It's very likely to be healthier and it saves you money. So how can you do your bit to fight the burger apocalypse? <coughs> By following my ABC of low carbon eating. Avoid wasting food, buy in season food and choose low carbon food more. Thank you. <laughs>